So here we are, uh, Emil Guillermo here with you. And my goodness, it says we're going live now. So we're live. I mean, as soon as I press live, we're live. Hey, hi. You know, you know, uh, I'm not just trying to match the tinsel on my Kulintang gongs or my Benny Agbayani jersey. I'm, you know, that it is a, uh, uh, you know, that we're in, in lockdown and that uh, my my hair is so long that I no longer uh, care. Uh, I mean, I, I have to have a, my loincloth on my head because, you know, it's Zoom and we're only top up. I mean, we're only top up and everything's cool. So here we are with you. It's Sunday, the Sunday brunch at the museum with Emil or wherever we call it, the FOFMU, Friends of the Fonz Museum, or just the uh, Emil Amok on a Sunday morning. Uh, my name is Emil Guillermo. I'm the vice president and museum director of the Fonz Museum, the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum, a legit 501c3. We have a 1500 square foot gallery in downtown Stockton that we must close down because of COVID. And so we're only open on the weekend. So I thought, we can't be open physically, but we can be open spiritually, mentally, virtually. Here we are on uh, Facebook Live, and we're 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 live. We're 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 live, and um, you know the the good thing about being live is that well, the good thing about being live is that. You got to catch us here, either on Emil Guillermo Media on Facebook or on the Fonz Museum page, F-A-N-H-S Museum, you know, live, because we do this on Facebook Live. I would, we post it later as a recording. But the way to, to experience this is to get it live. You can say, oh, well, it's real. You know, his hair's getting long. He's wearing the, the loincloth on his head. A Filipino one bought from... Bought from uh, Ty and uh, Thelma Buckholt when they were selling these things at the uh, Fonz, uh, Fonz get togethers. Excuse me. I have a, I had a, a frog in my throat. What was that frog doing in your throat? I don't know. It was croaking. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're here. We do this. Uh, and if you catch us, I want to, front loaded to tell you what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this week or Filipino American history, this week in Filipino American history. It is technically this week because we're going to talk about something that happened on the 20th. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, how to, how to, how to experience this. The, the way to experience this is use your fast forward. And if I go over for, you know, 10 minutes, 20, 30, an hour, use that fast forward slider and just go forward and just get it all on the recording. Of course, when you're live, you can't, you got to sit through the thing. So Emil going on and on and on. No, but, but uh, always thinking about you. So use your fast forward and then think of this as radio. Think of this like radio where, okay, I'm going to put it on, on Facebook. I'm going to play the audio on my speakers, and then I'm going to wash the dishes or do whatever. And uh, Emil's going to be talking and you have my, my museum buddy there, right? We can't go to the museum to see Emil and Terry and Chris and all the other folks are part of the museum team, but we're going to catch them live. And we're going to experience the museum through me. Oh, experience the museum? Well, how are we going to experience the museum? Well, I mean, I mean, he's talking in front of a Benny Agbayani. Agbayani means hero. A Benny Agbayani Mets journey jersey, which is a kind of historical artifact. Benny, the best Filipino American major league baseball player, position player, position player. We all know that Tim Linscom is the best Filipino American who ever played. Major League Baseball, double sigh, double no hitter. Tim Linscombe, any dispute? No, but Benny, Benny was the batter. Benny, oh, left-handed. Benny was the batter. We got the cool and tongue gongs here and the tinsel. So, uh, you know, this is the, what we're going to, we, when I like to say that the museum is where you are. Uh, 
the museum is your story. It's Filipino American stories, and we're going to tell some Filipino American stories today. So hang in there, because we're going to talk all about what happened in 1920, a very important day, a very important day, especially if your family came from Hawaii, from the Philippines to Hawaii, a very important day. And then I, I just want to touch briefly on, you know, if you go to our Facebook page, you know, you could, this is where you can um, experience a lot of our, you know, what, what, what we're doing. So right here, so let me play it here. Share screen. Okay, so if you go to our Facebook page, you see here, uh, if you want to donate to the Fonz Museum, there's this uh, little story I tell. Juanita Salai Wilson, this is her mother, Virginia Reimer. This is her dad, Max Salai. And it's one of the stories. She was a listener uh, or a, someone who came to our Facebook pages and she shared a picture. She came on, she shared the story with me. And I, you know, because we do this, we tell each other stories. And I thought this would be a great way to like, let people know this is what we do. Come contribute to the museum so we can continue to tell the stories. And then, would you know, a friend of mine from Atlanta, Georgia, donated some money. I want to say a, a shout out to Stephen Sudler uh, out in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. I, I saw Stephen for the first time in many, many years, more than 30 years. Uh, I saw him five years ago. We were at a reunion. Uh, for the radio station, not for the entire school, but for the radio station. And he saw me and he came up and he embraced me and hugged me. Can't do that now. But he, and he's a big bearish guy, Stephen Sutler. And we both were playing soul music at the college radio station. And we had stories to tell, stories to share. And he donated $50 to the museum. I appreciate it, Steve. Steve's a doc now at, at at Kaiser in Atlanta. And, you know, I was thinking, this is why he's a doc. He, I, I stepped into the, the reunion. The first, he was the first guy I saw. He greeted me, right, with open arms. And wouldn't you know, he's a doc. He's an OBGYN. He delivers babies. Wouldn't you want to be a baby delivered by, by, by Stephen Sudler? I mean, there you are. You're coming out of the womb. And he's so welcoming. Come on, come on out. Come on out. So I want to thank uh, uh, my friend Steve for contributing. I mean, that's what uh, these fundraisers on Facebook are about. You get our friends are involved. Our network expands. This is a national museum because the stories are national. We tell stories about Filipino Americans, not just in California, although this is where they first were. We talk about Filipinos all over in Texas and Chicago and New York in the South and the South. Some of the first Filipinos came. Right there, Louisiana, Jean Lafitte, that area there, south of New Orleans. They jumped ship, they settled. They weren't the first. We know now that the first Filipinos were off the, the central coast of California, 1587. But Filipinos on those boats, when boats were the, the transportation of the world explorers, Filipinos were the, the, the ship hands. They tended to be there. And when they jumped ship, they landed somewhere. That's where they, they settled. That's where they settled. That's where they became Manila men. In the case of California, well, they didn't jump ship there. They got off and then they left. And you can go back in our archives to tell that story about the first Filipinos. But in Louisiana, they actually jumped ship. They stayed there. And if you get a little Filipino taste in your jambalaya, that's why. So, and I, you know, I'm sure they got up to Atlanta. You know, Atlanta is known for its, uh, its Asian community now. There are a lot of Asian Americans in Atlanta. I, I went to... Um, I was invited to give a speech in an Atlanta church and it was just full of Koreans. The, the Korean churches are big. 
and they they looked at me and I you know I was able to relate to them as Asian Americans and uh, now you know that's a big deal in the South the Asian American community are they going to vote January January 5th uh, they're voting now and you know, that's the thing about early voting you don't just vote on the day on election day but there is an election day but the 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 early voting has begun in uh, in Georgia so uh crossing our fingers not being partisan here but uh just wanting to make sure that the elections uh are fair and that Asian Americans do go out and vote Filipino Americans especially so my friend Stephen is in in Atlanta and uh, he gave to uh gave to the, the museum via this Facebook page. So uh, definitely check that out. Check, you know, if you want to give, it's on, it's on the Fonz Museum, Facebook at Fonz Museum page. You can check us out there. Also, you could check us out on, uh, where else? Uh, you know, we just do all, you want to see other ways to experience what we do here. Go click on the, where it says more and click on live. And if you click on live, you will see all our posts exhibited there, all our past videos. And all our videos are, are pretty good. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty interesting videos. This one especially with Dan Gonzalez talking about Pearl Harbor Day, Filipino-American response. Uh, we talked about Don Mabalan's book and her interview with uh, – uh, Mrs. Carrido, Camila Carrido, um, talking about how Filipinos reacted uh, during Pearl Harbor or after Pearl Harbor. After 10 hours after the uh, Japanese struck Pearl Harbor, they went to the Philippines and they, they took over the Philippines, occupied it for the next two, three years. And the reaction, of course, by Filipinos here was just, they were... You know, they, they were as anti-Japanese as the Americans were. The, there was no difference. Very strong sentiments because the Japanese then went from Pearl Harbor to Manila, to Luzon. And that was not good for Japanese Americans here because Filipino Americans were very irate and very violent, according to the, the oral histories that were obtained by Don Mabalan from people like Camila Carrido. Read her book, Little Manila's in the Heart. Um, it's history, it's truth, and it's worth looking back, reading it, and imagining the history of December 1941 and how Filipino Americans reacted here in Stockton. Anyway, uh, so I talk about that with Dan. I talk about that, uh, you know, and, and that's a continuing story in, in December and on through January, how Filipino Americans reacted with World War II coming up. And if you read Don's book, it was the watershed moment, the watershed moment for Filipino Americans, you know, in, in the 40s. Suddenly, they were not considered second class in the way they were traditionally seen as second class, they were considered allies. Big difference. Uh, talk about some other things. So you see, you know, uh, I talked to Dan a lot. Dan is a, a good guy and we're gonna have him back again, hopefully uh, to talk about the current situation. But anyway, uh, this is how you, you listen to us. You go back and you go to, once again, that's on um, our Facebook page the Philippine American National Historical Society Museum, click on uh, where it says live and you'll go to the, the page where it has all our videos. That's how you do it. The other way to do it is really to, uh, to, to listen to, to what we do here. Uh, meaning, um, you know, pretend it's radio, uh, click on it and then have the the speakers on in your laptop or your computer and then you know, do your thing you wash the dishes do the laundry you know i'll tell stories if i have a guest you'll hear guests like uh, yesterday we had julissa cummings who is the president of the board and you heard her talk about you know the future of the museum we want to open up but we can't open up sooner than we can 
because of the COVID crisis. And you heard her say that, yeah, it's pretty bad right now. And there's probably going to be a Christmas spike because people aren't paying attention. They're not masking up. They're, they're gathering in the small groups and they're traveling. Look, I know it's hard. Uh, we, we would like to be open for the, uh, for the holiday, for, to, to welcome people into our 1,500 square foot space in downtown Stockton. But it's, it's not safe. And we can only accommodate maybe two or three people at a time because in a 1,500 square foot space, you, you get the staff there. How many people can you bring in? And to be within the limits that are set by, by what is considered safe. And who knows what's considered safe? It seems to change all the time. And I know some people are saying, darn it, we're not going to close. We're going to stay open. Or you can't tell us what to do. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. But let's not make public health a political thing. Because in the end, uh, we can harm each other. And if you're asymptomatic and go out and harm someone because you've passed on the virus, not good not responsible. So that's why uh, we follow the rules as set by, at this point, the governor. At this point, we, we listen to the CDC, but because of where we are uh, with uh, the Trump administration, well, they're on their way out, but we haven't had the leadership. We're behind we're behind in terms of modeling the kind of behavior. And now everyone is saying, Hey, I, I heard some people, people I love people close to me say, I'm not listening to that. Hey, they can't tell me what to do. Well, you should listen to science. You should listen to what's going on in the hospitals. And unfortunately, if you don't, I think history will judge us harshly for being ignorant of how to deal with the virus on a on a public basis on the basis of public health it's sad but uh you know i i, I mean already people are saying oh wow well, what is what is wrong with us well there's still people who think this whole thing's a hoax it's not a hoax i just Look at the hospitals. Try to find an ICU bed in the San Joaquin Valley. Try to find an ICU bed in Los Angeles. It's no hoax. It's real. And I, I, I think we just, we've had a failure of leadership that has brought us to this point. And thank goodness, it looks like we will have a new leader on January 20th, if, if all goes well, who knows? <laughs> you know, we'll bring up Filipino history. I wrote about martial law. The talk about martial law this over the last 10 days or so, that was no joke. They did discuss it, although Trump tried to reverse himself and say, no, no, there was no serious discussion. There were some loud and angry conversations, if we're to believe the reports, and there were more than one. And we even heard Michael Flynn, the pardoned Michael Flynn, say, yeah, you know, martial law, Trump could do this. He could do, he can go into all the states where there's an issue with the voting and we can vote again, bring in the military and vote again. So martial law, the threat of martial law is no myth. And I know that as soon as I say martial law, all Filipinos should say, oh, wow, this is, we know martial law. We know what happens in martial law. Filipinos stand up. Filipinos revile martial law. Filipinos stand up to that. And they say, no. You know, we, we, we believe in freedom. We believe in democracy. Because the Americans told us that. That's part of Filipino-American history. Because a lot of Filipinos are here because they fled martial law. A lot of Filipinos are here in America because they fled the kind of tyranny 
that is being hinted at today. So you can see Filipino American history and everything. Uh, you really can. And the current situation, well, this is the current situation. We have people out of work. We have people who've fallen off the unemployment rolls. We have small businesses that need help. If we had leadership, if we had a more bipartisan approach, and certainly we did. Finally, we had Steven Mnuchin is, he's pretty Republican, but he's just pretty money oriented, right? He got a deal through and how do we, how must he feel now to find that the deal that he tried to get through that would help all of us who are unemployed, who are trying, you know, trying to make small businesses work. Uh, how do you think he feels that now Trump has said, oh no, he's not going to sign the bill. He's not going to sign the stimulus bill that everyone works so hard to get through and compromise because now Trump wants more wants us all to get more money. Like, is that, he's sort of reversing himself now. And now the Republicans, poor Republicans, they don't know what to do. Well, Trump says he wants to give everyone $2,000 instead of 600, so we should support him, right? Go with the compromise. But Trump has to veto it first, and he hasn't officially done so. He's dragging his feet and everyone pays the price. Everyone feels it. Everyone's hurt. Everyone. That, that's, that, that makes it bipartisan. So I, I know you're, so many of you out there are hurting. You're unemployed. You're, you've fallen off the rolls as of Saturday. Unless Congress, Trump act. Uh, I know some businesses are trying to figure out, well, how are we going to make things? Well, we feel we're, we're right there with you. The museum the museum is a small business. And uh, although we did not participate in, you know, the, the big overall program to get money, um, I'm sure some of the monies that we got from the county were part of federal programs. They had some money. I don't know if they're going to have any money to help us as we try to stay open. Hard to stay open and then, and yet still pay rent. Because we, we, we do not get a break on rent. I, I know a lot of people also out there facing eviction, not just for their businesses, but also for their homes. So um, you should know, hey, we feel it. We feel it at the museum too. We're closed. We try to make do by doing these little sessions to let you know that we feel it. We feel for you. We're here for you at the museum. And we, we try to point to our, our video so you get a sense of Filipino American history so you're not just a slave to Netflix. <laughs> and so you can see some of our programming and get a sense of Filipino history. All right, so now, yesterday, you know, I talked about Philip Veracruz's birthday on Christmas Day, right? His birthday was Christmas Day. So I read something from the... Um, the New York Times, his obituary, because he died. Uh, you know, you, you can celebrate his birth, but if the man's passed away, let's celebrate him by reading what the mainstream media talked about him. And so we did that. Check that out on yesterday's video. Uh, I, we also talked about Delano, the grape strike, because Veracruz played a part there. And we also pointed out how Veracruz, the split, like we talk about Larry Itliong a lot and how Itliong was the person who started the strike, not, not Chavez, but Chavez gets all the credit. Well, Veracruz was up there too with Itliong and probably stayed a little longer than Itliong. Itliong was the first to leave after, after getting Chavez to say, come on, join the strike. Filipinos were first, right? Then. Itliong left, Veracruz stayed on, but ultimately Veracruz left. And the reason, and this is to credit the New York Times, the reason why Veracruz left was because of Chavez's seeming to be an apologist for Ferdinand Marcos and the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos, the martial law dictatorship 
of Ferdinand Marcus. So Monung Philip, he left, just like Monung Larry left. And the United Farm Workers kind of limped along without their real core Filipino leaders, Larry at Leong and Philip Veracruz. But it just points out that the people behind the labor movement that we saw in, in the Delano grape strike, Filipino Americans. And you get that in Dama Ballin's book. So uh, we do this thing called This Week in Filipino History. And so Philip Veracruz's birthday on the 25th, that was an important thing. But also another important day, and I, I don't mean to give it short shrift. It was a, a week ago. It was on the 20th. 15 laborers. And notice labor is a key idea. Filipinos came as laborers primarily, which is why Don concentrated a lot on labor history. What does labor history have to do with Filipino American history? Well, everything. Because the Filipinos were the laborers and the Filipinos brought to fore the, the idea that labor rights, labor history is civil rights and civil rights history. And if you look back at civil rights history, you go back to slavery and the, 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 the blacks, African-Americans, labor, slavery. We're still dealing with the fallout of that from 1619 when the Filipinos were brought to be a workforce. They weren't slaves. They were American nationals. And they were allowed to work for a dollar a day and once you realize that, you see, oh, they replaced the slaves. They became low-wage economic slaves. And how do, you, how do you lift these Filipino men up to where they belong? But to understand the labor history and the development of union organizing, and the Filipinos were key to that. Filipinos, Filipino Americans like, well, my dad wasn't working in the fields. He was working in the kitchens, member of the cook's union. But in the fields, we had people like Larry Itleon, Philip Veracruz. That's their place in history. That's their importance, not just to Filipino American history, but to U.S. history, American history. So today, I want to talk about something else that happened on, on December 20th, while we're still seven days, and technically it's still this week in Filipino-American history. Fifteen laborers arrive in Oahu, making or marking the beginning of massive Filipino labor migration to the United States. They are recruited by the Hawaiian Sugar Planter Association, 1906. Significant, 15, that's, that's all that was here, 15, or all that came to Oahu. But from that 15 in 1906, we saw that number grow from 1906 on. And they came from the Locos, they came from, they came from, the Visayas, they came to Hawaii, they came to work, they were recruited, 15 that year. And here's the thing about 1906. I was working at the Honolulu Star, or no, I wrote a column for the Honolulu Star Bulletin, like from 2000 to, I know, 1998 to about 2003, I wrote for the Star Bulletin. But I wrote for the advertiser, I wrote a, I was a member of the editorial board from 2005 to 2007. And in 2006, it was the 100th anniversary of the Cicada movement. Now, here's, now I'm talking to you here as the museum director. Back in 2006, which is 14 years ago, 
I knew the Filipinos went to Hawaii, but my understanding of the, the, the plantation owners and the recruiting of the Filipinos and their bringing them to Hawaii was not as real, it was not as real as it is now after having lived there, after having been there and read more. I was like many other Americans, I, the Hawaii, Filipinos, what, of course, they're same color skin, a lot of Filipinos there. But a lot of people don't know this history. It's not taught. So we talk about it because we, our parents, our family lived it, right? Many of them, I mean, once again, my father was came directly from the Philippines to the United States of California, San Francisco. But many of his buddies stopped in Hawaii first and then came. And that that is a particular a part of history that, well, it's an important in, in terms of labor. It's important in terms of, well, you look today, look at the, where the Philippines are today, and you look at the, the politics of, the, of, the, of Hawaii. We had a, a Hawaiian governor, a Filipino governor, Ben Cayetano, but we have a lot of Filipinos in the state house level and they haven't seemed to have gone on beyond. And a lot of them have had some difficulty just shedding the idea that, hey, they came here to work the plantations. It's still the residual effect of that still impacting what Filipinos still can do to this day. It's part of the baggage that we have to fight. And only by knowing and understanding the history do we understand, well, that's why we're still kind of where we are. Because people don't, haven't come to terms with the history. So at this point, I, I just want to go back to screen share so I can read Don Mabalan's book, Little Manila's in the Heart. Because Little Manila is in the heart does talk about this idea about before they came to the Philippines, as this is life in the provinces. You know, what was it like before they came to from the Philippines to Hawaii and then ultimately to California? And uh, this is this is from a section called Life in the Provinces. As the American colonial education system transformed the minds of young Filipinas, Filipinos attending public schools, their families in the provinces struggled to adjust to the new economic and social order imposed on the Philippines by American colonialism. Ah, one of the good things about colonialism, they, were, they gave us education, the Americans, right? They made us American nationals. They took over the country that there was this education. The economic shifts that were a result of the changing economy created conditions that along with colonial education, pushed thousands of Filipinas or Filipinos to look for better opportunities and wages overseas. American capitalism indelibly changed the economies of the provinces, particularly, particularly the northernmost provinces of Luzon and the Visayas. Notably, in the Olos region, where my dad's from, or on the islands of Cebu, Bohol, and Panay, the Visayas, or a lot of people from Stockton, they're from Bohol, Don Boholano, right? This is, was Visayan. The economy shifted from one of barter and subsistence to one dependent on cash, and as small landholders struggled to adjust to the new focus on exports. The deteriorating economy of the provinces, the stories told by turning pensionadas and pensionados, and the heavy recruitment of Filipino laborers from the sugar plantations of Hawaii, all were major factors in the immigration of Filipinas, Filipinos to Hawaii and the United States in the first decades of the 20th century. They had to leave. They, they wanted to leave. Because there was opportunity, and this is when you, they talk about opportunity, this was the opportunity. Go to Hawaii, go to America, 
it's better. The Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association, HSPA, which began heavy recruitment in the Visayas and the Ilocos in 1910s, eventually brought more than 126,831 Filipinos to Hawaii, not 126,832, 126,831 to Hawaii between 1909 and 1946. Now that's some number, huh? I mean, you got to admit, 16% of this population eventually moved to the West Coast, including California. And by 1910 and the 1920s, immigration to Hawaii or the United States became a viable alternative to migration to new lands in the Cagayan Valley for Ilocanos. Migration to the city or sending the oldest children in a family to be educated in Manila or Cebu. So imagine that. You're in the Locos Norte, like my dad, way, way north. And you're saying, oh, I could go to Manila where all my friends are and they end up in Tondo or I can go to the Cagayan Valley or I can go where can I go? I mean, he's a, in 1928, he's 22 years old. He says, I'm going to America. Thousands of families responded to economic conditions and the promise of an American education by sending family members, mostly sons, oh, how discriminatory, to Hawaii and the United States with the hope that they could improve the family fortunes. Because, of course, you send back money. Families in the provinces were already struggling during the Philippine Revolution. That was the war that started after the Spanish-American War, and the Philippines was given to the United States for a small amount of cash, 20 million or so. And the Philippines revolted, led by Aguinaldo, the Philippine Revolution, also known as the Philippine-American War. The arrival of the Americans did little to disrupt the system of land ownership in place under the Spanish. In fact, the entry of American monopoly capital worsened landlord-tenant relationships and benefited only the most elite families and American business interests. Once again, the capitalism, if you see American names, Americans going over there, it was like, oh, they were seeking adventure from the elite establishments in, in America saying, I'm going to take my money and see the world. I'm going to the Philippines. I'm going to invest this capital. Constantino argues that the Americans had a vested interest in increasing the land holdings of families who already had large haciendas because these land holdings produced the raw exports, especially sugar, copra, and hemp, desired by American capitalists. To meet the demand for export crops, haciendas strove to enlarge their holdings. In some, Constantino writes, the Philippines was exporting most of its raw materials, such as sugar, copra, and hemp, while purchasing American manufactured goods in a drastically uneven ratio. There goes the imbalance of trade. In 1900, the total American share of the value of the import and export trade in the Philippines was a paltry 11%. That was in 1900. By 1935, it was say 2%. The import export trade. In 1899, 1899, 9% of all imports to the Philippines came from the United States. So you see how things all just changed. By 1933, Filipinos purchased 64% of their total imports from the United States. So suddenly, American companies and elite landholders reaped the benefits. As a result of these economic dislocations, thousands of lower middle class and poor families and single men and women migrated from Ilocos and the Visayas to Manila and Cebu for work, which strained the urban infrastructures that had to handle many new unskilled and unemployed arrivals. So you see how capitalism worked, right? They made it so that Filipinos had bought more from America. They imported more. 64% of their total imports from the United States after being like nothing. Capitalism, colonialism, hand in hand. 
In the first decades of American rule, wages were lower than during this late Spanish period. So is colonialism better? Not according to this, with workers earning an average of one peso a day. And four out of five families live below the poverty level in Manila. Conditions were worse in the provinces. That's where my dad was, up in Luang. Even in prosperous sugar-producing areas such as Pampanga and Negros, annual income averaged 185 pesos, half of what was considered subsistence level annual income. The American regime also brought new opportunities for the landholding class in every region. In the Ilocos region, elite families emphasize education and political participation in the American regime. To finance an education in Manila, lower middle class families were forced to mortgage or sell off parcels from their already small land holdings. After the onset of American rule, an increasingly attractive option for elite families and small landholders was to leave for Hawaii or the United States for an education and work. Sadly, when migrants returned from Hawaii and with main flush was cash, they were hampered by inflation caused by the high demand for land amongst returnees. So you see what happens, you go off and say, I'm gonna come back, you can't go back home. Once you were an American, you made it, you had to, you went back, maybe you were able to, to survive that kind of economics where it was all topsy-turvy, hit by inflation. But for the most part, but you had to be pretty rich. For the most part, when people were asked to repatriate, you couldn't repatriate if you didn't repeat, if you didn't go back rich, if you didn't strike gold in, in the United States, if you didn't, uh, you know, somehow get lucky with an education and got, we were able to get a job. If you, if you weren't rich in the first place, in other words, right. Couldn't go back home with nothing in an economy that was wrecked by capitalism, wrecked by, by, the colonial American existence. And that's really what hampered the Philippines. Most of the immigrants who had stocked in before World War II were Ilocanos and Visayans from lower middle class families who were small landholders or tenant farmers who could sell farm animals, mortgage parcels of land, or sell crops. They were not peasant laborers, the starving poor, or the elite. So, middle class families. They had a middle class in the Philippines. And if you were middle class, you took the exit out and came to America. And, you know, it's funny how decades and decades of that kind of existence later in the Philippines, when I went to the Philippines first in 1980, I saw no middle class. There was no middle class there. But we know where the middle class went. They came to America. Some immigrants had resources and land and came to the United States for adventure. Some had educations, but they could find no jobs in the small towns and remote provinces of the Philippines. Or if they did, the wages were too low to support a family. Tenant farmers, the poorest of the poor, had nothing to mortgage or sell to raise the 180 pesos for a steamship ticket and thus could not leave the Philippines. That's what it took. You had to have 180 pesos to get that dollar steamboat to the United States. Almost all the immigrants to Stockton came from impoverished provinces in the Ilocos region on the island of Luzon and provinces near Ilocos, such as Pangasinan and Tarlac. I think, I think Larry Itleon was from Pangasinan. A smaller number were Visayan immigrants who came from rural provinces in the islands of Cebu, Panay, Leyte, and Bohol in the central Philippines. From 1906 to 1924, Ilocos Norte, yay, dad! And Iloka Sur sent approximately 32,707 immigrants to Hawaii. Oh, then not my dad. Notice 1906 to 1924. And my dad came in 1928. Other areas that sent large numbers of immigrants included Pangasinan, Cebu, Bohol, and La Union. In 1929, the provinces of Ilocos Norte. Yay, dad. Pangasinan. Pangasinan, Emil. Okay, okay. Ilocosur, Tarlac, La Union, and Abra, all on Luzon, sent the most immigrants to the United States. Now, this is my dad. In 1928, Ilocos Norte sent the most immigrants to the United States, approximately 2,833. 2,833. 
Bangasanan sent 2,226. Alokasur 2,045. Tarlak 519. 872. Abra 271. Come on, you Abrans. Alokas Norte 2,833. Not 2,834. And which you not, know, probably my dad was 2,833, the last one on the boat. He could have missed it. He didn't miss it. Almost 90% of Filipino immigrants to the United States before 1930 were Ilocano. The Ilocanos. Yay, Ilocano. Although I, I know no words except when manong. I know how to say that. I know, oh, I, I know how to sound like an Ilocano trying to speak English. But they, my sister speaks more Ilocano than I. She married an Ilocano. Anyway, 90% to the U.S. before 1930 were from, from were, were Ilocanos. The Ilocos region is a dry stretch of land that emerges from Pangasinan province at the Mangayan Gulf and extends north for 160 miles. The soil is rocky and for the most part lacks the fertile richness of the rice and coconut growing lands directly to the north. Most farmers in the region before and immediately after the American colonial period practice subsistence level farming. So if you farmed, you were farming for dinner. If you farmed, it was uh, tomatoes and, uh, you know, greens and saluyot. And uh, it was for your pinak, for today's pinak bet or tomorrow's pinak or next year, next month's pinak bet. All these provinces had an extremely high population density. In the provinces of Locusur and La Union, as well as the island of Cebu, there were almost 500 people per square mile. 500 people per square That's crowded. Furthermore, the average landholding in these regions was only about an acre. Well, that's all it is if you live in, say, Stockton or Tracy. Because of the lack of land, there are a few large haciendas in Locos even at the end of the Spanish colonial period, few families own more than 60 hectares each. So by the early 20th century, Ilocanos began to leave the region altogether and work in Pampanga in the sugar centrals or in Hawaii or in the United States. So they all left. They were leaving in large numbers. They came to America. The hardships of farming created an Ilocano regional culture that valued thrift, hard work, and frugality with a high value placed on migration to new land for better opportunities. I don't see anything there about drunkenness or, or, or gambling. So just, just kidding. By the 20th century, these cultural values earned Ilocanos rather unfairly a reputation among other Filipinos, as people who are naturally adventurous, as well as pushy, aggressive, hot-headed, land-hungry, excessively jealous, overly quick to resort to violence, and extremely provincial. Oh, that's not so. That's according to one anthropologist during research among Ilocanos in the 60s and 70s. Wait a minute, is that true? Naturally adventurous? They were being forced out there. Pushy, aggressive, hot-headed, land-hungry, excessively jealous. Oh, well, you know. Hot-headed, quick to resort to violence. Oh, 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 No, I don't know. Extremely provincial. And there you see a Locus Norte, in the map, where a Locus Norte is, is. It's way up there at the tip. It's like the forehead of the, or the, where is it? The Filipino nose? I mean, there's a mouth. And so it's like his hairline, I guess. La Union down there, Pangasinan is like uh, something on his neck. Tarlac is his Adam's apple. I get, I, if you, this is a man, man's in nose and his mouth and his chin. And Manila is like where he swallows and shows. And look, look where the, the Visaya is, the heart or the stomach, depending on how, how tall you want this guy to be. Oh, well, all right. The, uh, this is the, uh, where is it? it, it you know, the, uh, 
the Rorschach kind of map vision. Okay, so uh, the sociologist Miriam Sharma argues that the stereotype of Ilocano immigrants as lovers of adventure misses the point. Ilocanos migrated to survive. The poor soil in the region, the economic pressures placed on farmers by the export-oriented economy for thousands to sell their land and leave the region. This is, you know, you couldn't farm up there as easily and export oriented economy now this is colonialism forcing the people of the philippines to come to america now this is american history this is filipino history but it is american history because the people came to america these people this is what we're come what we where we came from this is why it's important american colonial officials ensured that the philippines remained dependent on the United States for most of its imports and exports, Sharma notes, and the U.S. demand for sugar, copra, and hemp created a disastrous situation for peasants and small landholders. Politically powerful elite landlords who owned large haciendas blocked agrarian reforms, and the American colonial government hesitated to change the feudal, feudal agricultural system that was hundreds of years old. Sharma writes, that the main industry in the Ilocos region soon became the production, reproduction, and subsequent export of human resources. Wonder why there's a diaspora. This is why there is a diaspora, because our human resources were what we could offer to foreign lands. At first, the United States, and now, look, I've got relatives in the Middle East. I've got relatives in Abu Dhabi, in Saudi Arabia. I got relatives all over the world because still to this day, human resources is what the Philippines exports. Moreover, effective exporting Ilocano labor on the struggling families left behind was not at all what the immigrants expected. The onset of the American period inflated the price of land. Inflation was made worse when thousands of dollars of remittances from workers in Hawaii and the mainland began flowing into the region in the 1920s. Sadly, many who left to find work in the United States found that they could not afford to buy land when they returned. And once again, this is one of the reasons why, even though they made deportation, self-deportation optional, right? from 1934 on in America. If you're a Filipino national coming, wanting to come back, you couldn't come back. You can afford it. It was cheaper in Stockton or to rent in San Francisco and lay low. The tribulations of the family of the protagonist in Carlos Bulasan's America is in the heart illustrate the brutal struggle to survive in the provinces of the Ilocos region in the 20s and 30s. The book's first part tells a heartbreaking story of crop failure, usury, that's a loaning, you know, get, being, giving, getting loans at high rates, unfair rates, land loss, starvation in Binalonan, Bangasinan, and just south of the Ilocos region, where many Ilocanos had settled. The family of the main character, Alos, places its hope hopes on the eldest sons who are studying to become school teachers. In order to pay for their education, the family mortgages its small farm. And Alice's mother works as a trader in the market, as in many women in the rural provinces. Hectare by hectare, the family land is lost to moneylenders until there is nothing left. And the prospects of completing their expensive educations are dashed. Alice's brothers, decide to leave for work in the United States. Carlos reluctantly followed them. Only Macario and I were left and I did not want our family to disperse further, said Alos. But circumstances strong in my hands and faster than my feet were inevitably dividing us. And no matter what I did, our family was on its way to final dissolution and tragedy. Eventually, Alos leaves Binaloan Benalonan to join his brothers Marcario and Amado in the United States. Although the details of Bulasan's story are largely fictional, 
The book was based on his own family's experiences, the stories of his friends, and the tragedies he witnessed as a young boy growing up in Pagasanan. So these are stories. Don Mabalan, we're reading from Little Manila's in the Heart, talks about Bulasan. The fiction is the soul of the real story of what was happening to the Philippines under American capitalism, under Americans there exploit and working in conjunction with the rich to exploit the middle class who sunk deeper and deeper into poverty, out of the middle class, deeper and deeper into poverty. So that by the time I, I got to the Philippines in 1980, 83, there was no middle class. There was only an extremely rich and an extremely poor. This is how it, how it goes. This is how it happens. And these are the stories that, that Don tells. She, he talks about uh, the family here in this section. The family mortgaged the little land they had left to raise the 180 pesos for passage to the United States, plus 220 pesos for expenses. The usurer, the evil money lender who loaned them the money, charged 60% interest on every 100 pesos borrowed. So you wonder, how did these people get the money? These people got money by going to the loan, the loan folks. Loan me some money. I'll, you know, give me some capital. I'll go to the United States. This is how it always works, huh? And if you do not pay it in one year, the agreement you signed with him says that the, the land belongs to him so that they were putting their land up as, as collateral. The family estate. So in this case, Juan Dionisio, Dionisio, Johnny bought a steamship ticket settled in Stockton by the late 1930s. Felipe Napala's uh, family owned several plots of land in which several tenant families raised rice, corn, bananas, sweet potatoes. The Napala family survived by asking their tenant families for a small share of their crops and by bartering the rice and corn for some of the daily catch of the village fishermen. They were in normal condition, said Nemisio Pagoyo a native of Loag, a locus of his family. Oh, that's my, that's my dad's. That's my dad's town, Loag. They were all right. They were not so hard, except they were not as rich as the people who are rich. They have enough food. They were the average family. Pablo Mabalan's parents, Victorina Magdaluyo Mabalan. Oh, I know some Magdaluyos. I know some Mabalans. And Guillermo Mabalan. Oh, practically related for lower middle-class land owners who owned rice and coconut fields in the same village. Th these are, are Don's, if Pablo was Don's grandfather, these were Don's great-grandparents. Pablo's inheritance, a small coconut and rice field, was sold to pay for a steamship ticket. So this is this is part of the story of how we got to Hawaii. I'm, I'm going to skip ahead to uh, Hawaii is glorious. Kazla Gloria di Hawaii. Hawaii is glorious. Because they all had to head, head uh, east from the Philippines. First stop was Hawaii. Most Filipinos arriving at the port of San Francisco from 1920 to 1927 had embarked not from Manila, but from, but from Honolulu. One of the thousands of immigrants who left Hawaii to settle in Stockton was Cirillo Yonke Juanitas. I know some Juanitases. This is the Juanitas family story. Who'd been born in 1892 in Barbaza, Antique. Antique province on Panay. Though his parents owned their own farmland, Cirilio was one of 11 children. When families were this large, it was next to impossible for all the children to inherit land. You get one 11th of nothing. That's not good. 
So 21 year old Cirillo was recruited in 1913 to work on a sugar plantation in Luhue, Kauai. After his contract expired, he took the SS Lurleen to San Francisco in 1916. By 1917, he had become the first Filipino hired by Stockton's Holt Manufacturing, the company that invented the tractor. Holt Manufacturing, Ben Holt Drive in Stockton. So you see how young guys, uh, my, my, my father was a, a younger guy coming in 1928, but the ones before him in 1890, born in 1892, they worked in 1906 is when the first cicadas went to Hawaii. Cirillo went there in 1913 and not to Hawaii, he went to uh, Kauai. And he went from Kauai to San Francisco in 1917 and from 1917, Stockton. And these were the first families of Stockton. Juanitas and thousands of other Filipinos who arrived in Hawaii in the early 20th century came to answer the labor needs of American sugar plantation owners who had wrested control of Hawaii from the monarchy in 1898. Unable to force native Hawaiians to work the sugar and pineapple plantations in the mid to late 19th century, plantation owners relied on imported Chinese, Japanese, and Korean laborers. When Asian exclusion laws in the United States barred their entry, and other attempts to get more labor failed, including the importation of Puerto Ricans. And you know, I know many Filipino or not Filipino, they look like they're Filipinos, but they are Hawaiian Puerto Ricans. And they're always confused for being Filipino, but they're not, they're just Spanish and Hawaii Puerto Ricans. That's how the HSPA turned to the Philippines. You see, the exclusion laws happen. They start importing all these other laborers. And now, voila, the Philippines, there, there are our folks. Let's get them, says a recruiter for HSPA in 1906, Albert Judd, tried to recruit 300 Filipinos to work in Hawaii. He was able to entice only 15 Ilocanos that he encountered in Manila, and he put them to work on the big island of Hawaii on the Ola'a, Ola'a plantation. And we read to you the 15 laborers arrive on Oahu, December 20th, 1906, recruited by the Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association. So it sounds like this is, although the, these are they, they arrived in Oahu and they went to the Big Island. Judd was largely unsuccessful in finding more recruits, partly because he was unfamiliar with the regions and languages of the Philippines. Well, there's 7,200 of them. Hey, you want me to learn them all? Well, yeah, if you want to ex exploit them all. He had a difficult time convincing any women to go to Hawaii, which explains some things about, you know, social and cultural things that happen in you know California and in Hawaii. No women wanted to go. Not to Hawaii. In 1909, the HSPA began recruiting Filipino workers in earnest after paying six a six thousand dollar fee to the Philippine colonial government, the organization began to recruit workers in two areas, the Visayas and Ilocos. The HSPA actively recruited Filipinos until 1926 when they stopped because so many thousands were coming to Hawaii on their own. Now that explains why my dad in 1928 didn't come to Hawaii because there were so many that he took the, the road less traveled, which was go directly to the United States. But just think, your face, you, you wanna come to the United States, you hear everyone's going to Hawaii and you say, I can't go to Hawaii, everyone's going there. I gotta go to the United States. I'll go to California. That took some guts. The first Filipinos arrived in large numbers in the early 1910s were families from the Visayas. Historians have yet to find any evidence as to why the HSP first concentrated its efforts on the recruitment of families in Bohol, Cebu, Panay, and Romblon. But it could be that the tradition of the entire Visayan families migrating to Negros seasonally to work the sugar plantations made these families seem more skilled and likely to adapt. 
Another reason may be because the Ilocos region was far from the main points of Manila and Cebu, which makes sense because Ilocos was way to the north. Manila, Cebu, close, get on a boat, call yourself a sacada, the name given to migratory laborers in the, in the Negro sugarcane plantation. So the name just followed over from Negros to Hawaii. Stories of the abusive recruitment system and harsh conditions filtered back to Philippine officials. And after 1915, the Philippine government forced the HSPA to provide return passage for laborers after the end of a three-year contract. So a lot of them didn't just like paradise. They were stuck there. The HSPA set up a main office in Manila with agents and sub-agents and recruiting offices in Cebu, Iloilo, Capiz, now Aklan province, and Negros Oriental. Per recruit, agents and sub-agents were paid seven pesos for Visayans and Ilocanos, but only five for Tagalogs. What? Seven for Visayans and Ilocanos and five for Tagalogs? Oh, why? Because they had been found to be picky about their work conditions. Oh, those picky Tagalogs, according to the HSPA. Agents showed films of the good life in Hawaii and bragged about the high wages workers could receive. They would show the Filipino a nice silver dollar and tell him that there were lots of them to be had in Hawaii, said Felix Tapia, who settled in Stockton. They also told them there was plenty to eat, that it was easy to get good clothes and have a good time. Beginning in the 1920s, HSPA recruiters focused on single Ilocanos, particularly those who were illiterate and therefore more easily manipulated and could perform hard labor, hard manual labor. Ilocanos and Visayans who could read and write but were desperate for work often lied and pretended to be illiterate in order to be told, I, let me go to Hawaii, I don't know anything. I'm dummy, I'm dummy head. Can you imagine that? You had to be dumb to be picked because they wanted a lyric. I cannot spell. I cannot spell pool. P-O-O-L. I'm a pool. You're a pool for picking me. To ensure that the recruits could handle sugar plantation work, recruiters looked for calloused, hard palms. Oh, I see. That's, you got soft hands. It looks like hands of a, are, I need alpha, not beta. You're, you're be too much beta. Seferino Jamero was an educated man in his barrio of Garcia Hernandez, Bohol, but he purposely chaffed or chafed his soft palms on rocks to fool the recruiter and pretend to be illiterate, according to his daughter, Luna Jamero. God, why could I ask Luna that? Oh, that's, why, that's why I like to rub my hands against rocks to show, hey, what am I? You think I'm a dressmaker? I'm a worker. Well, it worked, and uh, Garcia Hernandez, or Seferino Jamero, went to work. Or Garcia, Garcia Hernandez, went to work in Hawaii for a time before traveling to the United States. There he settled in the fields around Stockton, finally settling in Livingston, about 50 miles south of Stockton. Between 1906 and 1935, the HSPA brought more than 120,000 Filipinos to work on sugar plantations in Hawaii. Imagine that. It was like uh, they were the, they just sucked it out. They siphoned them out of the, out of the Philippines like a straw. Went to Hawaii. It's sort of like they showed these recruitment films that were enticing. Sort of like when you go to someplace and say, hey, I'll get you a free ticket, uh, free ticket to Las Vegas. You just have to watch my, um, my, my timeshare film. Same kind of thing, only in the past. But you could imagine the hard sell, right? The hard, the hard sell. So the best letters or the best advertisement for work in Hawaii came from letters and money sent back from the first cicadas. Villagers were deeply impressed by the fancy, well-dressed Hawaii, Hawaiianas, Hawaiianas, who returned to the Philippines after a three-year contract, their suitcase groaning under the weight of their American-made gifts. Oh, the original Balak Bayan box, hand-delivered. The writer, Manuel Boakin, 
remembered when a fellow townmate, a Sakata named Masong, began to earn the enormous sum of $3 a day, which he sent to his wife, Benita. He returned in glory, confidently dressed in an American business suit with $3,000 in savings. Boakan writes that Masong was called the shrewd and lucky adventurer from the rich sugarcane and plant pineapple plantations. Boakan remembers that a dozen HSPA agents swarmed through Ilocos, dazzling Ilocanos with promises of wages of $2 a day, $2 a day, $2 a day repeating the hypnotic story of Masong's incredible success. Ah, if you were starving in a locus, wondering what was gonna to happen to your family, you could be lured, you could be lured by images of success in the Philippines. And then they brought back ready-made clothing, a sewing machine, a photograph player, and Virgilio Felipe in Olocos Norte in 1917 says, we are so amazed by the machines. 1917, remember yesterday, I had a sign or a box of moon pies that my mother-in-law sent me from Cincinnati. Moon pies since 1917. Well, where were the Filipinos in 1917? Where were the Filipino Americans? Well, Virgilio Felipe was in his village in Olocos Norte saying, oh my God, a phonograph player and a sewing machine. We are so amazed. I want to go to America. But well, Hawaii first. But look, Felipe decided to go to Hawaii because when people talked about it in those days, they said, Kasla Gloria de Hawaii. Like heaven is Hawaii. Felipe and his friends and relatives were struck by the rich Hawaiianas returning. Returning to the province. So that's what it was. Stories of cicada success. So tantalizing. The people like Agapito Formoso and Emilio Balanzat. They decided to start a regular ship line between the Philippines and Hawaii. The first voyage began on July 3rd, 1927, reported the Manila Bulletin, and the ship carried 776 Ilocanos. The record is silent on whether or not other such voyages took place, but this voyage taken against warnings of its foolhardiness by government officials because the workers lack contracts illustrates how fervently Ilocano workers desired work in Hawaii. Because you'd see them, they'd have the Americana suits, the Stetson hats, even on a hot day, they wanted to come preferring instead to allow myth and rumor to make their experiences seem glamorous or perhaps because descriptions of the conditions they had lived in might prove too humiliating. Returning cicadas rarely shared their true experiences with their families. When they arrived at the plantation, cicadas were forced to live in barracks or subsist on substandard wages. Filipino workers were living in odious and desperate situations, according to Prudencio Remigio, the Filipino labor commissioner appointed to work among Filipino nationals in Hawaii. Workers found the 10 hour a day, six day a week schedule of cutting sugarcane almost unbearable. In the province, the ability to control one's own time made farm work less arduous than the never ending work on the clock demanded by the Lunas, the supervisors. And this was the reality that they all found. They all found that in fact, they didn't get the truth in those recruitment films. They lived in barracks. They lived like, how can you be a slave if you make a, a dollar a day? Uh, but uh, you weren't a whole lot better. The richly detailed diaries of Angelus Moragno a Rambolon native and later a Stockton resident, tells us a great deal about life in the Visayan community in Honolulu and about the migration of Visayans from Hawaii to the West Coast in the mid 1920s. So we talk about the sex ratio here. The extremely imbalanced sex ratio among Filipinos in Hawaii transformed marital relations and courtship and the scarcity of women 
led to violent altercations between male immigrants. Stories abound of instances in which men stole wives or women left their husbands for new partners in a practice called cowboy, 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 meaning cowboy, probably so-called because of the ways cowboys would swoop down and lasso cows. The practice is described later in the book here, chapter four. With her mother gone, Angelus had to help support the family. So imagine that because few women went to Hawaii, they had this cowboy, cowboy thing, which I read later on in Don's book, but it was a thing. And don't think that's a little thing, the sex ratios in the Filipino American community. It makes all the difference in the world about how families are started and stop before they could even start. Another Visayan family recruited to Hawaii were the Alcoys of Karkar, Cebu. Poor farmers, the Alcoys had been scratching out a living on less than five acres, where they grew gabi, taro, string beans, breadfruit, ube, purple yam, and mungo, mung beans. In 1904, the family was left destitute when the crops were ruined by disease and drought, and the far father passed away in 1908. So these are stories when they came and they found, they found, they found their life in Hawaii. As the last group to arrive in Hawaii, Filipinos had the lowest status of any ethnic group in the racial hierarchy there. Stereotyped as oversex and irrational. I don't know if that's true. And nicknamed Poké Knives by other members of ethnic groups because of their reported propensity for fighting with knives over women and gambling. Oh, you poke a knife, poke a knife. Filipinos struggled to find allies outside of their ethnic group and so solidarity within. Their penchant for gambling, arguments, and violence over women. I've never fought over a woman. I fought with women over money, but no as well as their love for cockfights and playing pool on Sundays. Hey, it's Sunday now. Inside of the ire of other groups in Hawaii, Lawrence Fuchs argues, there were deep ethnic, cultural, and linguistic differences among Filipinos, a situation they would also encounter in Stockton. In Hawaii, Ilocanos, Visayans, Tagalogs eyed each other with suspicion and dislike. Oh, what's your wrath? Uh, writes Benvenido Wanasa. With English fluency ranging widely among the immigrants, Filipinos in Hawaii found it difficult to communicate with one another and distress grew as stereotypes about one another abounded. Stereotypes, oh, what are the Ilocano stereotypes? According to Wanasa, the signs considered, them, considered themselves sophisticated, educated, and urbane. And they looked down on the Ilocanos who they considered to be cheap, they pasted illiterate rubes. Oh, that's not true. We are not what they call, uh, what is that? Cheap. We're not cheap. No, no cheap, not cheap. Many Visayans maintain that Ilocanos were to blame for the Filipino stereotypes of hypersexuality. Okay, I can accept that. Uh, and explosive temper. Oh, no, no, not true. In turn, many Ilocanos believed that Visayans were lazy, impulsive, unreliable, and extravagant with their money. Oh, those, those Visayans. What about the pretty Visayan? That was also a stereotype. Ilocanos were more frugal than their Visayan counterparts, averaging twice the savings of Visayans and having very little debt by comparison. Okay, that's not true. Where's the credit card? The plastic. Where's the plastic? The Ilocanos, Tagalogs, and Visayans were often in direct conflict outside of the plantation. All Filipino immigrants suffered horrific conditions and low wages. One of the most prominent organizers was a self-educated lawyer, Pablo Manlapit, a Tagalog immigrant from Lipa City, Patangas, who was recruited by the HSPA in 1910. Manlapit led two strikes in 1920 and 1924. The failure of both strikes, particularly the 1924 sugar strike, 
resulted in Filipino evictions from the plantations and the blacklisting of Filipino labor union members. Considered dangerous and subversive by officials in Hawaii, the HSPA and the American government in the Philippines, Manlapit was deported. He traveled to California in the late 1920s. What did he do in the late 1920s? To organize, of course, to organize workers and exhorted Filipino asparagus workers from Stockton to strike in 1929. Manlapit is a hero. The evictions forced thousands of his signs in Ilocanos to relocate to Honolulu, where they could not find work because most of the signs immigrated as families rather than single men. There was a preponderance of the sign families in Honolulu, while the majority of the Ilocanos were single men. After the strikes, many of the Visayan families left Hawaii for the West Coast, and they were later followed by single Ilocanos. The Alcoy Assis, ooh, Assis, that is uh, Tim Linscombe's family, the Assis family. Arca, Lagrimas, and Monroya families were among the thousands of mostly Visayans and Tagalogs who left Hawaii for greater opportunities in Stockton. In Narciso, Monrayo had participated in the 1924 strike. And after that, he had difficulty finding work in Honolulu. One by one, his relatives and friends began leaving Hawaii for the West Coast. And Narciso decided that migration to Stockton would be best for the whole family. Angelus' father, who, who Julian, was the first to go. He sent money, um, sent fair money back for Angelus and their father. They're going to America next month to work over there, Angelus wrote of her brother's and father's plans in her diary. They say that there are plenty of work there. Alberta Alcoy, Assis's husband, Hanaro, had been an organizer during the 1920 and 1924 sugar strikes on Hawaii, on Oahu. His union activity angered his boss, and eventually the couple and their children left Hawaii and moved to the Stockton area. So, what we saw is we see families. Moving from the Philippines to Hawaii, and then because they knew that Hawaii was not the greatest, we we they they left, they left Hawaii, they struck, they left America, and they came, they came to uh, or they they left Hawaii and they came to Stockton, and that's a little sampling of how this all came to be a Filipino American community, primarily in Stockton in the fields, Filipino community in, in the West coast and how from there they, they fanned out because of migratory work, seasonal work. They went up, some went up to be Alascaros, Larry Itliong went up to be an Alascaro. Some went to the East coast, some left California because they married someone, uh, a white Caucasian, they wanted to marry. So this is the beginning of the migration of the Philippines, of, of Filipinos from the Philippines to Hawaii and California. And I read it because December 20th, this week in Filipino American history, December 20th, 15, 15 of the cicadas show up on Oahu, recruited by the HSPA, the Sugar Plantations Association in Hawaii. A little taste of Filipino American history. We're full of it here at the museum. And you see uh, Mangalapit started the asparagus strike in 1929, how he was there at the HSPA and how a lot of them because of the strikes in 1924, they left and came to Stockton because they could not they couldn't go back to the Philippines. They couldn't stay in Hawaii. The last next stop, the United States, the West Coast, and ultimately for many of them, Stockton. So a little taste, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, put your comments in the box. Uh, if I read about your family, say, hey, Emil, that's my family too. Put it in the box, we'll comment, we'll get you on, we'll get you to tell your story about what you know. Luna Jamero has been on this. You can go on the Facebook page live and you get uh, her comments about it. We've talked to her. We've talked to Peter, her brother. 
And uh, in fact, it'd probably be good to talk to them again soon. Uh, again, a repeat here on our museum program, the Sunday Brunch. So I hope you enjoyed today's Sunday Brunch. We do this Saturday and Sunday. We're, we're closed. The museum's closed, but we stay open virtually to share Filipino-American stories, to share things with you. Like I said, the best way to appreciate what we do here is just, hey, turn it on. Just, you know, let, let, let the speakers go and then just use it as radio, right? When you see the recording come up, push it, listen to it, use your finger on the fast forward, go up to certain parts and get the story. And, and then contact me at the... Um, a muck guy. Let's see, let's use a muck guy. A muck guy. A muck g u i. A muck guy at gmail.com. A muck. You like that one? Or just go, go to my website at lumpiaking.com. Lumpiaking.com and leave a message there for me, and we'll we'll get your story on on the museum. So that's it. Uh, a lot to. Once again, if you're in the current situation. My heart goes out to you if you got lopped off the unemployment rolls because of a uh, lack of action by the by the government, or if uh, say you're a small business struggling. Hey, we feel for you. The museum is a small business. We're struggling, but we're staying open. Uh, like us, share share this video with your friends. Make a comment. That's the currency of Facebook. Um, and if you want to support the museum in our quest to make rent when we're closed, which is kind of a ridiculous situation, but it's a situation we find ourselves in, go to our Fonz Museum Facebook page and go to uh, that little page where I say, hey, here's a way to donate to the museum for the end of the year. It's fully tax deductible and you help us stay viable with you during the pandemic. All right, so if I haven't said this enough, Merry Christmas to you all. If I, you know, feel like I haven't been Christmassy enough, I hope you enjoyed your, your holiday, socially distanced, and in the name of public health. Back again throughout the week, I sometimes I pop up. If there's something coming up, I'll pop up. If not, Saturday and Sunday, next Saturday and Sunday, maybe with you, because the museum is where you are. Once again, I'm Emil Guillermo. I'm the uh, vice president of the board and the museum director. And uh, we were reading from Don Bohalano Mabalan, Don, the late, great Filipino American historian, US history trained, uh, Stanford grad, tenured at San Francisco State, and the author of Little Manila's in the Heart reading from her book to gain some insight and to let the history sink in. Let the history sink in. If you thought you read it, I hope you've enjoyed my annotated reading because this is our sharing of the Filipino American story. So as I'm sure Don would say at this juncture, thank you for joining us. As Don would say, and she would say this, she would say, Mahals and Salamat.